Welcome to Driving Forward, I'm Demisha Greater. When tracks are overloaded or in poor shape, the disaster that this could lead to could cause a catastrophe. Uh, joining us to discuss how to avoid this is Gavin Kelly, Technical and Operations Manager at the Road Freight Association, and Patrick O'Leary from Fleet Watch. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's maybe start with you, Gavin. All the time that we, well, not all the time, but most of the time, if you listen to the radio, or if you are watching something on television, might say that there's an accident. And if a truck is involved, it's not something that is a surprise. So is the statement fair if I say that the state of trucks on South African roads is certainly in very poor condition? Obviously, I'd be biased in having to answer that. And I would say, no, it's, it's not true that a large amount of the trucks on the road are in good condition. The problem is this, is that every time you move with a vehicle, things start to happen with a vehicle. And so obviously things start to wear, they start to tear, and they start to deteriorate. The problem that we have in this country is that we don't check those trucks often enough. There aren't good systems to make sure they maintain the standard they need to maintain. And then what do we do with the trucks that we find that are not in a good condition? We allow them to carry on. We find them but we allow them to carry on. So what we, what we need to do is to take those bad vehicles off the road, whether it's a truck, a car, a bicycle, or a bus is immaterial. We've got to have a system we can continually check the standards and then take the ones that don't meet those standards off the road and not be scared to do that. Hmm. Patrick, how much of this has got to do with overloading? Or oh, we've heard maybe a truck has lost its load, which can cause a catastrophe I and then sometimes it's an issue of overloading. I don't think uh, uh, the, the, the amount of um, crashes have to do with overloading. That is a problem, but it's a separate problem. I think one is to segment that. Um, it is to do with, as Gavin said, maintenance of trucks. Uh, we do an exercise called brake and tyre watch. Uh, Gavin has been on a few of them. We've tested over the past five to six years uh, something like 645 trucks, and we have failed 68% of those trucks. Now, some of those trucks have horrendous faults. I'm talking about no brakes in the drums and this type of thing. And I always like to say that you have a first world component in South Africa, trucking. That's more the bigger companies and some of the small to medium sized companies who exhibit best practice. But the majority of the trucks on the road are run by operators who actually don't give it two hoots about road safety. They don't maintain their trucks. We have a skill shortage of diesel mechanics as well, which adds to the problem. And I think Gavin's right in saying where we do find such trucks, and when you test in, say, 20 trucks and you fail in 15, we park them off, but then they do go back on the roads and it leads to the system. Bribery, you know, that is a big thing where the cops get bribed. Leadership, I don't know where leadership is anymore. I don't think there are leaders here. Okay, I think the politicians of today are worried about the ANC politicians are saving Zuma instead of saving lives and saving South Africa. I don't think we have leaders. Okay, we have politicians, we don't have leaders in terms of that, of, of road safety and implementing action. Section 50 of the Road Traffic Act allows the MEC to do exactly what Gavin is saying. Take an operator off the road if he's habitually crashing, has a, his vehicles are habitually found to be unroadworthy. You can cancel that operator's license. Not once has that been done. On the operator side, Section 49 of the Act spells out the duties of an operator, which basically keep your truck roadworthy and keep your vehicle and keep your driver fit to drive. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean running the comrades, training, etc. I doubt whether 10% of operators know what their duties are. So it's a failing all over. Oh yeah, so Patrick's mentioning a couple of things there. No, lack of leadership, it, uh, he is speaking about government there, but there's also a responsibility to corporate South Africa to ensure that these roads are worthy. Now, to me, I think what you're seeing is that we're facing an octopus here with, with a number of legs that are sick. And how do we, how do we deal with that? Because it's a partnership between corporate world, private sector, public sector, and then the one thing we none of us like, which is the enforcement, the stick part of it. And we're not going to get this right if there isn't consequential, guaranteed outcomes for what you do and what you don't do. The Act is very clear about maintaining your vehicle, whether, irrespective of what it is, we're talking about trucks now, the Act is very clear about that. Now the first question we could ask is, how come is it so bad here, but it's much better in the EU or in Britain or in America, and we get those trucks from there, so why do they go so badly here? Why do things fall apart? 
Do we not have uh, safety standards in place? There are safety standards in place. So We've got we the best road traffic act in the world. We've got the best systems that have been designed to ensure that things go properly. The problem is we don't have the human resource capacity or the will to check these and to take the problems out of the logistics chain. Let's take a simple example of the UK. In the UK, the RFA, there it's called the Hauliers Association, runs a lot of these standards and polices the operators and doesn't give them an operating license long before they go to the Ministry of Transport and they need to get whatever else they need to get. So the industry itself does checks and says, hang on, wait a minute. If we look at what your systems are and how you're going to maintain these vehicles and your cash flow, etc., etc., you're not going to be able to operate a bunch of vehicles because you need this amount of money to maintain them. You need to go into an accredited service area. That's what we're lacking here. We're lacking a will, and Patrick's mentioned it, a political will, maybe a, a countryside will to actually say, this is the standard, this is how we're going to operate. You either tow that line or we take you out. Mm. And when I say take you out, I mean take yes. you out of the business. Yes, of course not. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Patrick, let's uh, look at another issue here. You mentioned skills being a problem. Um, mentioned? One, skills. Yes. Yes, <laughs> besides all the other things that you'd mentioned. To... To what extent do you think that we don't have the balance right if we look at the trade-off between cheap labor and maybe not getting the labor with the correct skills and uh, just getting people on the road that maybe may have those skills? Are we not getting that balance right at all? I think that in the, the, the transport uh, sector, you had, what was it, Tita? It's still there. It's failed dismally. It was supposed to train truck drivers, it's supposed to train a whole whack of things. We don't have a culture of training in South Africa anymore. It used to be the apprentices system, the old spoon, it used to train artisans. An artisan is a skill, a highly prized skill overseas, a low down skill over here. And that is where we are, uh, in, in terms of diesel mechanics, the guys are battling to find diesel mechanics because it hasn't been promoted as a career. Youngsters can make more money in diesel mechanics than they do out of any BA stuff. What about the FET colleges Forget and the technicians? Them. They're not producing the right people. They are not producing the right skills. We need to sit around the table. And I agree with Gavin. Let's hold hands. It seems to be a them and us. The government, and I, I, I will say this, the government has a critical role to play, but so does private sector. We've got the experience. Years and years of trucking experience of what can go right and what can't go right. The minister doesn't have that experience. Please listen to us, hold hands with us. The minister changed, I call it the Minister of Musical Chairs, the Department of Transport. There's been four different ministers in the past five years, I think. And how do you, how do you expect them to, to get that? Now hold hands with the industry and we can solve a lot of the problems. Don't come with the attitude which was said to the RFA where we will legislate as we see fit. Patrick, if I put you in that position right now, yes. made you the Minister of Transportation, yes. what would be the first thing that you would do? What would my question be What would to? be the first thing that you would do? I would take her in a truck, and I would put her in a truck and I would ride to Durban with her at night, and we'd stop along the road and we'll talk to truck drivers. We'll take her to truck stops. We'll let her see life on the road. See what the industry's facing. We will then take her, as I did with Masam Kutu, Kapisa Masam Kutu, when he wanted to ban trucks. We took him to a transport operator to show him how trucks work and how the trucking industry works, because I don't think the minister realises how the industry works. So I would take her and show her, bring her into the industry and let her experience some of the problems and successes and the vitality of the industry as well at its total necessity and contribution to the growth of the economy of South Africa. Gavin, what would you do? If I was minister. If you were minister, there are a couple of things that uh, are not working. We've had some successes and we can maybe highlight that at some point. But things are that are not working right now. What would you do? I think the critical issue lies in terms of taking the problems off the road. So I would definitely change the way in which law enforcement is done. We cannot have a situation that we have in this country where law enforcement knocks off at four o'clock in the afternoon. So we've got to sort that out. We need to get our, our officers trained to understand not so much to do policing, but to identify the risks or identify the shortcomings or the problems on the vehicles and take those vehicles off the road. Whether we then go into a process of like the taxi recap, I think probably the first thing I'd do is get decent stats on exactly what the problems are, because we don't know. Mm. We, we've got sort of ideas that brakes fail, but brakes don't fail. 
Things happen. You can have a truck with perfectly good brakes, but the brakes don't stop the vehicle. Why? Other factors can be in there. So what we first need to do is say, that happened because of that, that happened because of that, and sort that out first. So that's the first thing I would do as a minister, is I want to know why that happened there. Not thumb suck could have been, because then I can go to the cause and deal with the cause. And if it's training, I can sort out training. If it's policing, I can sort out policing. We've had an incident down in KZN now with a, with a truck, a nasty incident. It's burnt, it's killed people. Did the truck stop at the, at the compulsory truck stop at the top? So questions like that. And if it did, it means its brakes worked. We hear hearsay from a motorist that the truck overtook the car. Why? Was the car in the truck lane? Or what happened? So as minister, I would want to know what vehicle am I getting? No, I want to know what happened there and why did it happen and how are we going to fix that? Very key thing now, um, at the moment on the African continent, there is a huge push from road to rail. Do you think that because you've got this huge from, uh, you know, for this push from road to rail, it is taking away investment that we would be seeing on our roads into the rail and therefore leaving uh, our roads with a deficit of investment? Very quick one. No, I think that is a separate budget. I mean, I went to the, uh, it was Brian Malefa mm. before he took over Eskom to his roadshow. And he said there was no money, in uh, no hassles in terms of raising money for the investment rail leader. I think the provinces have used the money in the wrong places. Okay. Take the R74. That was a pristine tourist route, or so a truck route, um, going to the hotels in the Drakensberg. It was neglected to the point where it became a sand road. Tourists were taken off there, trucks don't use it, it damaged roads, the money was incorrectly spent or given to somebody. You know, the land of the ping pong must stop in South Africa. We talk about corruption all the time. Mm -hmm. I think the provincial roads are in a shocking state and they have the budgets, they have had the money to spend on those roads, but they've spent it in other areas. I don't know, maybe jacuzzis in the back of the house, I'm not sure, or another extra Mercedes beds. But the, John Kennedy said, what did he say? He said uh, a couple of things, but he said, that it's not the good economy that gave us our good roads, it's the good roads that gave us our good economy. And we've forgotten that. That's a good place to leave it. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, having the both of you here. Thank you so much for your insight. A very big thank you to Gavin Kelly, Technical and Operations Manager at the Road Freight Association, and Patrick Leary from Fleet Watch. I uh, thank you so much for watching. That's all we've got for Driving Forward this week.